<laughs> yeah. Yay, we are live on Facebook. Woo! Sorry about that, Facebook. <laughs> Sorry to keep you waiting. And thank you, Zoomers, for your patience mm -hmm. as well. Yes. And welcome officially to our virtual campfire, A Tale of Two Parks. Woo! Now, we'll get to that other park in a second, but let's focus what's on what's important, us. <laughs> uh, my name is Alex. This is Michelle. Hi. We work here at beautiful Castle Rock State Park in the modern day Santa Cruz mountains of California. Um, if you wanna, if you're not from the area, not familiar, you wanna check us out. Um, if you hop onto whatever, you know, Google Maps, whatever map service you use, uh, you can find us. We are the Castle Rock State Park. Lots of Castle Rocks Lots actually. Castle Rock. um, but we are the Castle Rock State Park in Los Gatos, California. Um, so we're not really in Los Gatos, so that's the nearest town. So that is our address. So you can, you can find us there. Um, now, I'd like to take a, a minute at this point um, to acknowledge that we are here in the ancestral tribal lands of the Ohlone language family of California Indians. Um, the area that now makes up much of the park was the beautiful gardens, the bountiful hunting grounds, and vision quest locations for a number of tribes and village sites in the area, um, including the Siant and the uh, Achistaka village site. Um, so we want to acknowledge um, not only the uh, ancient Ohlone, but their descendants today as well, um, some of whom partner with us, and we're, we're very proud to share this land um, with uh, everybody. So thank you all for joining. Now, who exactly are we? What are we doing? Why are we doing this? Um, you might notice from our snazzy t-shirts um, that uh, we are State Park staff. We're not volunteers, but nor are we rangers either. Um, rangers, at least when you're talking about California State Park specifically, rangers are law enforcement officers um, who um, uh, do have you know, police duties, but also protect the park and the resources. And sometimes um, even do th programs uh, like we're doing now, like campfires. Um, what we are, who uh, staffers who are focused on public education and outreach, we're called interpreters. Sometimes we're called naturalists, um, although, you know, it's not just about the nature, it's also about the history and the culture of a park. Um, we kind of break into a, a lot of the different aspects of the natural and cultural history of parks. We break things down into digestible ways for visitors coming to do guided hikes or campfires or school kids coming to do field trips here. Um, so uh, that is what an interpreter is um, when it comes to California State Park. Um, people always ask me what language I speak, but uh, I speak banana slug and, and redwood, not, uh, not foreign uh, human languages. Um, so that is what an interpreter is. So that is what we are doing here right now. Um, now, I would like to take this chance now to send it down the hill a little bit to our friends and colleagues down at Henry Cowell um, Redwood State Park. We've got Dylan and Leslie. Dylan and Leslie, you guys want to introduce yourselves? Yeah, thank you for that fantastic introduction, Alex. Uh, as Alex and Michelle said, my name is Dylan. I am also here with Leslie Reyes, and we are interpreters here at Henry Cal Redwood State Park. And we are coming to you live from the observation deck. The observation deck is the highest point here in our park. It sits at about 805 feet above sea level, and wow. What a, what a terrific view, right? And happy to be sharing it with each and every one of you today. Um, <clears throat> before we get into our program, uh, I'd like to share a couple of park updates. Um, Castle Rock and Henry Cal Redwood State Park are open to the public currently. In the case of Henry Cal Redwood State Park, the only acceptance is in of Eden. That is still closed until further notice. But both parks are absolutely practicing social distancing. <clears throat> Pardon me. So if you decide to visit one of these parks, that is Castle Rock State Park or Henry Cal Redwood State Park, make sure that you are keeping a six foot distance from other park visitors and guests and make sure you are carrying a mask with you. So when you cannot keep a six foot distance, you can 
put one of these face coverings on. And also, please be sure to avoid large crowds and gathering and whenever possible, keep moving. If you can satisfy those items, then these parks are here for, for you to enjoy. Now, long before this land was established as Henry Cowell Redwood State Park, it was home to an ancestral Native American tribe known as the Cyant, or also the Zianti. The Cyant were among one of the many tribes that composed the Ohlone cultures in the Santa Cruz Mountains. And so today, on behalf of the entire uh, park of Henry Cal Redwood State Park, I would like to acknowledge our Native American partners and visitors and extend to them our deepest gratitude and appreci appreciation, pardon me, so thank you very much. That being said, <clears throat> uh, we're very happy that everyone has decided to join us this evening for a virtual campfire. Uh, it's a little bit interesting, but we're gonna have a lot of fun tonight, so thank you from the bottom of our hearts for joining us. And of course, what is a campfire without, well, a campfire? right? And so I'm going to turn it back over to my colleague Alex, who's going to talk a little bit about uh, fire safety and demonstrate to all of us how exactly to construct or build the perfect campfire. Alex? Oh, the perfect one. Okay. Pressure is on. I did this. I got it pre-recorded, so enjoy. Iris Amphitheater at Castle Rock State Park. We're going to build a campfire. Come on. Okay, so I'm going to start getting the spider webs out of my campfire in here. It's been a little while since I was our first of the season. Okay, now I've got some sticks and stuff in here. Gathering fire at most state parks is uh, not allowed, uh, but typically if you already have some in your fire ring, you know, you can, you can burn that, use that stuff. So I'm going to use just the sticks I have here to get started with that. I'm going to gather some of those up, and then I have a little bit of paper. It's going to be my fire starter or my tinder. That tinder is the real light stuff that you can just immediately light with the match. Okay, and so I'm going to use a piece of paper here for some tinder. I'm going to kind of ball it up into not super tightly packed balls here. It's still a little loose, kind of butter crumpled up. Okay. Then I'm going to put on the neck the tiny little sticks and this stuff really would be considered tinder as well. This small right here. Um, so I'm going to put a nice, I'm going to break this one out. It's got, got a lot of good tinder on here. And so I'm going to kind of create a little, little mound over. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to create a little mound over there. Some people like to do uh, TP some people like to do a uh, log cabin. As long as you've got the tinder lined up nicely, but so that it can breathe. I'm not uh, just creating a huge big pile here that's not going to have anywhere for the fire and for the heat to go. Um, I like to say that fire is a living thing, and like living things, it needs to breathe. Scientifically speaking, it's not a living thing, but you know, it, it's a good metaphor for fire building. Okay, I'm going to get all this little stuff on here. Okay, and then I'm starting uh, to uh, pile on top of that uh, slightly larger stick. So getting into kind of kindling territory here. Um, so you're kind of, you're building up the most flammable stuff at the bottom, then the next, then the next, and then that way you can work on your way up to bigger logs and stuff. I've got some scrap wood here that I'm going to be using, um, but we're not going to be building a very big fire today. We don't get Wi-Fi over here, so we're going to be moving our location for our campfire program itself. So we're just going to get this one started. So you'll notice there, got nice and a lot of places for airflow, so my fire can breathe. And so in a second, I can get my match down in there into the middle to that paper, to that tinder at the center. I'll 
but I can't get my match to it, and I can't light it, can I? Okay, so this is going to be a really good kindling right here, and once this gets going, I can move on to even bigger stuff, logs if I was doing that. Time to light it up. Let's see if I can do it. Just one match. Just to help my chance a little, I'm going to try to use this one match. Light a couple different spots on here. I'm very carefully going to adjust, add things where the fire's going. Careful not to burn my thingies. If I needed to, I'd give a little blow on that fire, but use some nice dry materials. And this looks like it's going. Oh, yeah. And so then I could uh, start adding logs, taking care not to crush my center. Um, but kind of propping logs up, um, and that's another good use for the log cabin formation. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. Nice. That is ready for making s'mores. Who's got their mallows out? Let's go. All right. And that is how you make a nice, easy one-match fire. You can tell how proud of myself I was on that. Um, now, so the fire is started, but to re really get this campfire started, I'm going to send it back to Leslie to crank it up a notch. Leslie? Hi, everybody. Thank you, Alex. That was an awesome campfire, and I am very impressed with your campfire making techniques. I still have a hard time making fire, so thank you for that. Um, so what is a campfire program, a traditional California State Park campfire program without songs, without s'mores, um, without games? So today I'm going to sing a song. You're going to help me sing along, and later on we're going to play trivia. So. How many of you have heard of the song Louie Louie by the Kingsmen? You know that song? It goes, Louie Louie, oh baby, I gotta go. Have you heard that song before? Maybe you have? <laughs> well, we have a song that sounds a lot like that, except instead of saying Louie Louie, we say Tan Oak, Tan Oak, oh baby. Let the xylem flow up. Yeah, 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 yeah. Wait a minute, what is xylem? <laughs> well, plants and trees, more specifically trees, have a xylem and phloem transport system. The xylem brings water and nutrients from the roots up to other parts of the tree. So up through the trunk, the branches, and to the leaves. The phloem is a tra transport system that brings sugars and nutrients from the leaves through the branches, down the trunk, and to the roots. So in this song, when we say, tan oak, tan oak, oh baby, and when we say, let the xylem flow up, we're going to touch our knees and bring our hands all the way up to the sky. Just like that. Let the xylem flow up. Yeah, 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 yeah. Tan oak, tan oak. 
Oh, baby. And this time we're going to say, let the flow -um flow down. So you can put your hands in the air. Let the flow -um flow down. Yeah, 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 yeah. All right. So I'm going to need you to sing that chorus with me. And then with each verse, you're going to repeat after me. Okay, you got that? So the chorus we sing together and the verse you're gonna repeat after me. Now, I have some lyrics I'm gonna share on the screen with all of you. So just one second. All right, so hopefully all of you guys can see this here. Good. All right, and I guess I should say, the reason why we are singing about Tan Oaks is because Castle Rock State Park and Henry Cowell Redwood State Park have quite a few Tan Oaks, and Tan Oaks are really important to this ecosystem. Um, they've been used in many different ways by um, humans, and they provide food and shelter for a lot of the animals that are here in our parks as well. So this song's going to talk a little bit about what these town oaks do, what they provide for us. So let's start with that chorus. Are you ready? Okay, here we go. Tan oak, tan oak. Oh, baby, let the xylem flow up. Yeah, 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 yeah. Tan oak, tan oak. Oh, baby, let that flow and flow down. Yeah, 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 yeah. All right, here's the first verse. The leaves need the sun to get the photosynthesis done. It takes wet from the ground and it spreads it around. All right, everybody, tan oak, tan oak. Oh, baby, let the xylem flow up. Yeah, 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 tan oak, tan oak. Oh, baby, let that flow and flow down. Yeah, 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 yeah. Good job. It's the oak that's tan. <laughs> and it gives us a hand. It's where the Ohlone go <laughs> to get the acorns that grow. All right, everybody, the chorus. Tan oak, tan oak. Oh, baby, let that xylem flow up. Yeah, 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 tan oak, tan oak. Oh, baby, let that flow and flow down. Yeah, 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 yeah. Woo! Good job, everyone. <laughs> That's always a fun one to sing at campfire programs. And usually we have people pop up out of their seats, but because we're standing in front of a tripod, we have to do it a little bit differently. Um, so one of the ways that I like to keep all of our campfire uh, participants engaged is by playing games. And one of my favorite games to share with our participants is trivia. It's a good way to get a little bit of information, maybe some hints or precursors to what our program is going to be about. Um, but it's also a way to retain some really cool information about the parks. So this game, let me stop sharing, just to stare at the, the screen um, with all the lyrics. So this game of trivia is going to um, be me asking you a question. And then you're going to decide which park this question refers to. A, Castle Rock State Park, or B, Henry Cowell Redwood State Park. So our first trivia question is, this park is known for its Vaquero sandstone, which is popular among the rock climber population. A, is it Castle Rock State Park, or B, Henry Cowell Redwood State Park? Now, you can type your answer to trivia questions in the Q&A box if you're watching on Zoom, or you can type your answer in the chat box if you're watching on Facebook. 
So this park is known for the Vichetto Sandstone, which is popular among rock climbers that visit this particular park. If you said Castle Rock State Park, ding, 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 you are correct. Good job for all of you that answered that um, correctly. And we'll be talking a little bit more about that Ricciardo um, sandstone in just a little bit. All right, so question number two. The sandstone and mudstone in this particular park is known for its fossils, such as shark teeth and sand dollars. Is it A, Castle Rock State Park, or B, Henry Cowell Redwood State Park? Which park is known for fossils like shark teeth and sandstone um, in the sandstone? <laughs> hmm. If you said Henry Cowell Redwood State Park, good job, you are right. And we will be talking about the sand hills where that sandstone is located later on in the program as well. Okay, so we've got another trivia question for all of you. This park is site to some of the first measurements of Earth's magnetic field. What? Holy moly, which park was the site of some of the first measurements of Earth's magnetic field? Would that be Castle Rock State Park or Henry Cowell Redwood State Park? Mm, if you said Henry Cowell Redwood State Park, you are wrong. I'm so sorry. It's actually Castle Rock State Park. <laughs> Good. Okay, so this park is home to many endemic organisms that live in a really special habitat. It's a very rare habitat. Is that Castle Rock State Park or Henry Cowell Redwood State Park? Which park has a very rare habitat with lots of endemic plants and animals? Now, endemic means they live in a, in a niche, so a, a very special um, habitat, and they're, they're usually not found anywhere else. Is it Castle Rock State Park or Henry Cowell Redwood State Park? All right, if you said Henry Cowell Redwood State Park, ding, 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 you are correct. Good job. Good, and we have one more trivia question tonight before I'm going to pass it on to Michelle. Okay, so this park is located along one of the highest ridge tops in the Santa Cruz Mountains, and this is where coast redwoods grow. Is it Castle Rock State Park or is it Henry Cowell Redwood State Park? Type your answer in the Q&A box or in the chat box. Mm, this might be a tricky one, but if you said Castle Rock State Park, you are correct. Good job. Thank you, everybody, for singing that fun song with me, Tan Oak, Tan Oak, and for playing park trivia as well. Now we're going to talk a little bit about why Castle Rock State Park and Henry Cowell Redwood State Park have come together for this really special joint virtual campfire program. And I'm going to pass it on to Michelle to talk about one of the many similarities that we share. Hey guys, thank you, Leslie, for, for passing that on to me. Um, Henry Cowell and Ca Castle Rock are both in our mountain sector of Santa Cruz. So we are kind of in similar areas, but if you have visited both of our parks, you may have noticed that there are visually a lot of differences between our two parks. But if you dig a little deeper into our history and into our natural culture, you'll find that there are actually a lot of things that we share. Uh, one really important thing that we share is uh, logging. Logging and milling both affected our two parks a lot, especially of what you see in their ecosystems out in both of our parks today. 
Uh, back in 1864, the California gold rush was all the rage, and there's a huge migration of people to California. Uh, this increase of people came the influx of lots of housing and lots of businesses, including the logging business. Uh, just about 35 years after the California gold rush, there were 28 logging and milling sites just here in the San Lorenzo Valley watershed and in Big Basin area. Altogether, those logging and milling companies were capable of putting out about 34 million feet of lumber a year. That's enough lumber to stretch from San Diego, California up to Portland, Oregon six times in one year. And a majority of that lumber was made from redwood trees. Now, Henry Cowell and Castle Rock have redwood trees. They once used to be old growth forests, but due to a lot of logging and milling, that completely changed. A lot of old growth trees were cut down to make those houses and roofs and furniture to provide areas to live for all of those newcoming immigrants. That completely changed our forest. We went from old growth forests to new growth and secondary growth forests from Castle Rock all the way down to Henry Cal and all over Santa Cruz. Uh, Alex, do you think you know any other similarities that we share between our parks? Rocks. In fact, we both rock pretty hard. Hey. <laughs> uh, I would say up here at Castle Rock, we rock even harder than Henry Cowell, except we're talking about most of our rock is sandstone, and that's not very hard, so that kind of falls apart. Oh, again, sandstone joke. Okay. Uh, no, but the geology, and in fact, the underlying geology of the parks are inextricably linked, really. So, as I said before, we are both here in the Santa Cruz Mountains. At Castle Rock, as Leslie mentioned, we're basically up the top on the ridge. Um, a lot of people call us or refer to us as the gateway to the Santa Cruz Mountains and to the San Lorenzo Valley for that reason. Now, my friends down at Henry Cowell are really smack dab in the middle of the valley there and the mountain areas in general. Um, so, they are a, a little bit lower. Um, but we've got the same forces, same geological forces, really uh, creating the situations uh, and the environments we're seeing in both parks. So let me take you back in time, if you will, 15 million years ago, just 15 million years ago, I should say, on the geological scale, that's not that much. If we're talking about mountains, uh, really, these are kind of like the teenagers of mountains. And like teenagers, they're in a constant change, uh, a state of change and growth. Uh, so 15 million years ago, this, all this land would have been underwater. Um, the inlet or the, uh, the coast of California was much further inland than it is today uh, as the sea level was higher. Now, um, the mountains uh, uh, were caused by plate tectonics. Anybody remember their elementary school geology? Um, so if you imagine my hands are tectonic plates, huge shelves of rock um, on which sit uh, our land masses and our oceans. We've got two in particular we're talking about. So California, the coast of California is right at the meeting place of two of these tectonic plates. The North American plate, where most, uh, which no, most of North America, the land sits on the continent, uh, and the Pacific Plate, now which uh, has most of the Pacific Ocean. The Pacific Plate, okay. Oh, and both of these plates are essentially floating on a huge underground ocean of magma. Okay, so what you've got is the Pacific Plate running into the Northern American North American Plate and subducting under, it, going underneath it. Right? That is what is called a convergence boundary because the two plates are converging, they're coming together, okay? and one is subducting. In this case, the Pacific Plate under the North American Plate. Um, millions of years ago, uh, that motion of subduction stopped, and then you get the two plates sliding along each other um, along that fault. Uh, this is called a transform boundary, and it creates a lot of seismic activity, basically earthquakes, which cause uplift, pushing the land up out uh, from the sea floor. 
And because it was C4, that's why sandstone makes up so much of the uh, rock uh, bosses or uh, formations that, that Castle Rock gets its name from. I'm gonna share with you, I'm gonna share my screen here, um, some pictures because we don't have any uh, really of these bosses within Wi-Fi reception. So let me share the park. Okay, so um, this is from Goat Rock. You can see the, uh, the, the sandstone, the kind of rough uh, uh, surface of the uh, sandstone. Now that is a little whole little depression called Tafoni, okay? And that's very common. Those are caused by water thousands, even millions of years of water getting under the porous surface of the sandstone um, and uh, dissolving the, essentially the cement that keeps the rock uh, together, okay? That's called calcium carbonate and it is essentially the fossilized organic remains of like tiny little, you know, macro and micro sea creatures, okay? Um, so basically the fossils and that kind of creates a cement. Like if you think of a brick wall, it's brick, the mortar to stick together and then more bricks. And so the mortar is holding together all of the bricks. It's the very same way with the calcium carbonate holding together the other harder um, minerals of the vaquero sandstone, okay? And so you were seeing this one right here with some water. So it's actually doing that process right now where the water gets in and then it wicks the calcium carbonate up to the surface causing holes or depressions called tophony. This is from Castle Rock, the Castle Rock itself the boss from which we get our park's name. And you'll notice this is a much more significant cave, but it is technically Tifoni, just like the, the little divot I showed you before. Um, here's another shot of Castle Rock. And if I zoom in, you can see the really intricate kind of um, almost pattern looking. A lot of people, when they see this, think that perhaps that's been tunneled out by some kind of animal or bug or something like that. Um, but nope, that is just natural erosion over thousands, even millions of years. Uh, and it is the Vaquero sandstone that the creek of Castle Rock um, cuts through um, and, uh, and flows out of. That is it a few weeks ago. Um, it's getting a little dry, to be honest, but you can see that, sand, that stone covered in moss. It's all the same um, sandstone as we we're looking at. And uh, oh, here's another uh, set of rocks with some Tifoni, the uh, Magoo Rocks, uh, possibly my favorite name for any of our rock formations uh, over here. They're, they're pretty close to the Castle Rock. Now, because uh, the sandstone um, is formed in these great big bosses, these awesome formations, these, you know, cliff faces, um, and because the sandstone itself is pretty um, soft and good for um, installing in anchors and bolts, uh, it is, uh, this is an incredibly popular park for climbing. Um, today I saw dozens of people going with their ropes and their little pads for bouldering things. Um, so it is a very popular park for that. So you definitely want to, um, you know, follow the rules, be practicing safe, uh, you know, practices and, and equipment and everything if you're going to do that. Um, but that's probably one of, uh, one of the uh, cool things about our park. Now, uh, that geology is all, all the same. Uh, the underlying geology, although we get uh, a little more of the, the big impressive rock formations, um, but so that seismic activity is similar at both parks. But uh, here it's kind of one of the marquee natural features. I mean, it's right there in the name Castle Rock State Park. Um, now, I think that uh, my friends down here in Cal are going to uh, a little later uh, expound on their geology. Uh, but for now, do you guys wanna share the uh, marquee feature of your park, uh, Henry Cowell Redwoods, eh? Hmm? All right, thank you, Alex. Yes, so Henry Cowell Redwood State Park, Redwoods State Park, um, are our iconic um, natural resource for Henry Cowell Redwood State Park are the coast redwoods. And I have to be honest with you, when I first applied for this position, I thought I was going to be working in a vast redwood forest. I had just come from Northern California um, up in the North Coast Redwoods where they have large redwood trees. But here I am, a sandhills habitat, 
But Henry Cowell Redwood State Park does actually have a pretty large, um, large groves of redwoods. And we do have old growth redwoods too, just not exactly where I'm located right now. But if you look behind me on some of those mountain tops out there, and right along the perimeter here of our campground, which is just below us here, you will see coast redwoods. Now, we do see coast redwoods at Castle Rock State Park as well, up on those ridge lines. But here's the thing. The reason why we don't see coast redwoods here in the sand hills is because redwoods need lots of water in order to survive. They're really huge trees. Now, if you think about the Statue of Liberty and how tall that statue is. Imagine flying in an airplane in New York City, looking out that airplane window, you see that Statue of Liberty towering over the city, right? Well, coast redwoods can grow taller than the Statue of Liberty. Matter of fact, they can grow 70 feet taller than the Statue of Liberty. Could you imagine if a redwood tree was right next to the Statue of Liberty and you were flying over in an airplane and seeing a tree that was taller than the Statue of Liberty? It's pretty amazing, right? People come to the Santa Cruz Mountains um, every year um, and from all over the world just to experience these pretty amazing trees that we have in our park. Now, one of the, one of the most special attributes to coast redwood is how they reproduce. So I have a redwood cone in my hand and I'm going to hold that up to the camera for you. So this here is the size of a coast redwood. It's about the size of a grape or an olive and it contains up to 125 seeds that are about the size of a tomato seed. Now, I just told you that Coast Redwoods can stand taller than the Statue of Liberty, but they have a cone that's the size of a grape or an olive and a seed that's about the size of a tomato seed. How does a seed that, that, is, that is that small produce a tree that is over 300 feet high? sometimes 26 feet in diameter wide and 1,000 to 2,000 years old. Hmm. Well, what would you think if I told you that coast redwoods don't have a, a lot of success germinating from seed? And that's because redwoods um, are situated in habitats that have a lot of leaf litter or what we call duff and these tree canopies don't allow a lot of sunlight to hit the forest floor so most of the time when these trees when these seeds or cones drop to the forest floor and they're covered up by that duff they're not getting a lot of sunlight most of the time animals will either eat the seeds or they'll end up getting rotten by the time a sprout forms. So instead, redwoods have the ability to clone themselves or um, sprout new tree growth from reiterations. And reiteration is um, a sprouting point on a tree that maybe like a broken limb or if the tree trunk was injured or the root system, it could send up a sprout from the tree limb. You might see 90 degree angles like this. So this would be the reiteration or the new growth of the redwood tree. Um, they also have something called a burl. It's a big knobby growth on their trunk um, where a lot of dormant growth tissue resides. And if a tree is experiencing stress, they can send a shoot up from that root as well. Now, like I said, redwoods do need lots of water. And here in the Santa Cruz Mountains, we get about 80 inches of rain during the winter on average. Um, but in order for redwoods to survive here during the summer, when it's 
it's what on average, I would say 80 plus degrees, sometimes hotter, they rely on another source of water. And if you can see behind me, right there, you can see a little bit of it there. I don't want to turn the camera because I'm worried we'll lose our connection. But the fog is actually rolling in from the coast. So by the time we finish this program, this platform that I'm standing on, the observation deck, will probably be covered in fog. So redwood trees have adapted their um, their leaves to help them obtain water in the winter as well as in the summer. They actually have two different types of leaves. So I have a sample of their shade leaves which are located on their lower branches. You can see they're flat, they're long, they have nice um, surface area. This allows them to obtain lots of water and sunlight. Because remember I said redwood forests don't allow a lot of sunlight into the bottom of the, of the forest floor. But as you go up the tree and higher um, into the tree canopy, their leaves change. They get a lot smaller. Um, they're more needle-like and they don't have as much surface area. And that's because they're higher up, it, closer to the um, top of the tree canopy, and they're trying to hold on to as much water as they can. Yeah, so um, speaking of water, I'm, I'm gonna pass it on to Dylan, um, and he's gonna talk a little bit about the San Lorenzo River and the tributaries that connect Henry Cowell Redwood State Park's Redwood Forest to Castle Rock State Park's Redwood Forest. Thanks, Leslie. <clears throat> um, Alex, previously I heard you uh, mention something about a stream, right? Now that makes me believe that there is a lot of water up in the mountains at Castle Rock State Park. Indeed, there's also a lot of water here down at Henry Cal Redwood State Park. So this is the last similarity that we would like to uh, share with you folks watching at home. Um, and that's a, a river system, and more specifically, a, an entire watershed. So Henry Cal Redwood State Park and Castle Rock State Park share a very, an, an incredibly special river. It is called the San Lorenzo River. Now the San Lorenzo River is the centerpiece of the San Lorenzo watershed, okay? Now to understand what watershed means, because it's a pretty fancy word after all, um, we're gonna use our hands. So I really, really encourage everyone watching at home to do uh, as you see me do, because it really helps to understand what exactly a watershed is, okay? So we're gonna take one of our hands, and everyone can do this at home, you can raise one hand. Uh, we're gonna take our second, and we're gonna Put them together. Create a mountain. Now if we reverse this, now we don't have a mountain, we have a, a valley. We have a valley, don't we? Now, I am going to, well everyone should spread their fingers like this, and we are going to use our imaginations and pretend that the spaces in between our fingers are rivers. Okay, these are all rivers here. And so we have a bunch of rivers coming down this side of the valley, and we have a bunch of rivers, there we go, coming down this side of the valley, and they're meeting in the middle, right? A watershed is where rivers flowing in one direction meet rivers flowing in the opposite direction. And so we are essentially recreating the San Lorenzo watershed with our hands. And this is the biggest watershed in the Santa Cruz Mountains. The rivers flowing this way down the valley are meeting the rivers flowing this way down the valley. Uh, yeah, so that is a watershed. Uh, as I previously mentioned, the San Lorenzo watershed is the largest in the Santa Cruz Mountains. And it occurs in both Henry Cal Redwood State Park and in Castle Rock. But there's a catch. 
Here at Henry Cal Redwood State Park, we get the best of the river. The river is very large, it is very robust, and it flows beautifully. Up at Castle Rock, that is where the San Lorenzo River begins. So those are the headwaters. So the river starts in Castle Rock. Um, it, doesn't, it doesn't really blossom into its full potential up there as it does here at our park. Um, so, so Alex and Michelle, you might be the, the bigger rock stars, but whatever, we're not bothered. I will say that it was quite shallow of you though. <laughs> Um, so we have spoken briefly about some of the similarities between Henry Cal Redwood State Park and Castle Rock State Park. Now we are going to turn our attention to some of the differences because I'm willing to bet that there are a handful of differences that give each park its special spice and its special character. The, the, the big difference here at Henry Cal Redwood State Park has to do with a very special ecosystem. And a lot of my colleagues have kind of introduced this previously in our program. It is called the Santa Cruz Sandhills. And this is the ecosystem that I am actually speaking to you all from. Um, the observation deck here is right in the middle of the Santa Cruz Sandhills. Let's together, let's learn what exactly the Santa Cruz Sandhills are. And then let's learn, learn, pardon me, why they don't occur at uh, Castle Rock State Park. And I have some great examples to help us understand this, this ecosystem. I'm going to grab them here. Okay. I have two examples of different soil types or, or dirt, right? One of these examples uh, can be found in different ecosystems here at Henry Cal Redwood State Park and in Castle Rock State Park. And the other soil type is found in the Santa Cruz sand hills. So everyone watching at home, which, which jar do you think is, is, uh, composes or, or makes up the Santa Cruz sand hills? What do you all think? This one, right? Yeah. It certainly looks like beach sand, doesn't it? And as Alex d explained to us previously, it actually does come from an ancient ocean. So this was the bottom of the ocean floor a long time ago. And because of a lot of geological movements, so movements uh, by the earth and with the earth's tectonic plates, this sand was pushed up. And it was pushed up in different pockets. And one of those pockets is where I'm speaking to you from today. And that is what, well, that is one thing that characterizes the Santa Cruz sand hills. That is these very, very sandy, coarse, and fast draining soil. Water goes through this soil very, very, very quickly. Water does not pass through this other soil very quickly. Water is kept or retained in this soil. Now, to, to understand a little bit better the differences between these soil types, we can once again use our imagination and uh, talk, talk about markets. It sounds silly, doesn't it? Um, and it is a little bit silly, but it's very helpful to understand the differences between these soils. This soil is a little bit like the Costco of the, the dirt world, or we could say the, the, uh, the geologic world. So this is the Costco. It has everything, everything you could imagine it has, right? Those things are the nutrients, all the nutrients in the soil, right? This soil is a little bit like the fruit stand of the, the geologic world, the, the dirt world, right? It doesn't have as many items to choose from, but if it does have what you're looking for, it is darn good. Yeah, fruit stands, Costco. Now, the Santa Cruz sand hills are also characterized by uh, chaparral plants. So these aren't trees. There are a few pines, um, but not many trees here. Much more shrubs, wildflowers and shrubs. So coarse, sandy soil and shrubs, okay? 
this ecosystem um, is, it, it is very, very small. It's very unique and fragile. There's only 4,000, just under 4,000 acres of the Santa Cruz Sandhills left in this world. And we actually saw a resident of the Santa Cruz Sandhills fly behind me here, a hummingbird. I don't know if anyone was able to catch that. Um, I got off topic, I'm so sorry. Um, what was I saying? Yes, so 4,000 acres of this ecosystem, and that is it in the entire world, 4,000. Right around 600 occur here in this park, in Henry Cal Redwood State Park. Because it is so fragile, it is also home to many sensitive um, animal and plant species. So there are six endemic or endangered species that live in this ecosystem, and they don't live anywhere else. So it's a very, very special, a very special ecosystem. Uh, so even though both of our parks do have sandstone the santa cruz sandhills ecosystem only occurs within the boundaries of henry cowell redwood state park not castle rock state park so so take that castle rock uh i bet you don't have any santa cruz sandhills ecosystems up there do ya We may not have any uh, sand hills out here. We do have a, um, a, a lot of great rocks that you can actually climb on, which makes us pretty great rock stars, like you mentioned. Uh, not only are we amazing rock stars, uh, but although uh, Castle Rock and Henry Cowell are birds of a feather, we are a little bit higher on the pecking order because we have a very special and unique rare bird here at the park. Here at Castle Rock State Park, we are very honored to be a part of the habitat range of the marbled merlet. The marbled merlet is actually a really endangered seabird. It loves to go hunt in the ocean for tiny little silver sardines and other small fish. And then it takes its fish all the way back here to the redwoods that you can find in this area. Now, one main reason the marbled merlets are endangered is because they have a lot of predators at, Ca at Castle Rock State Park. Their main predators are corvids. Corvids include birds like crows, ravens, and stellar jays. And the reason there are a lot of crows, ravens, and stellar jays here at Castle Rock State Park is because of crumbs. Sometimes visitors tend to bring in food with them with the park, and sometimes that food leaves behind trash and crumbs. And that trash and crumbs attracts corvids like, like stellar jays, ravens, and crows. These crumbs with these high populations of corvids puts the marble merlet in a lot of danger because when we bring a lot of trash into the park and we increase their predators' numbers, they don't stop at just eating the crumbs. It will also try to eat the eggs left behind by the marble merlet. The marble merlet can only lay one egg a year, and that one egg a year is really important to try to boost the marble merlet population numbers. One way you guys can help support those marble merlet babies and make sure those eggs hatch into healthy adult marble merlets is to be a part of our crumb clean commitment. When you bring food into Castle Rock State Park, we ask you guys to commit to not leaving any crumbs or any trash behind. When you take part in our crumb clean commitment, that means you are directly helping protect these beautiful marble merlets, continue to fly back and forth from the ocean to Castle Rock State Park and live their wonderful, beautiful lives. What? Oh. What's that I see? Is that a saxophone playing explorer who would never dare to leave crumbs behind in the park? I think it is. In our comments, if you guys can guess what song our sax explorer is playing, let us know and we'll see if you can get it right. Come on, sax explorer.
Oh my gosh, thank you so much, Sax Floor. That was amazing and wonderful. Thank you for that wonderful tribute to uh, our San Lorenzo rivers and other wonderful rivers out there in the world. Hopefully you guys were able to guess that song. Uh, now to end our campfire tonight, we've got a couple stories to share for you about some of the history. We've got my story that I'm gonna share with you guys about some of our beautiful and his cool history about our park. Uh, you guys may not know this, uh, if you've come to the park, you've probably seen the Castle Rock in the Castle Rock Cave. But there was once upon a time a long-term resident of that cave. Um, in the 1880s, there was a lot of people starting to move into the mountains and settle in. But they had to provide everything that they needed for themselves, including their education. The students in these mountain homes didn't have a teacher until Ida Jones came on the scene. Ida Jones was the very first teacher of the Castle Rock School that happened right here at Castle Rock State Park. In fact, right next door to the Castle Rock. But they didn't have anywhere for Ida Jones to live when they first started the school. So throughout the first semester, Ida, for those six weeks, lived in the Castle Rock Cave and continued to teach her six students all about the amazing, wonderful world of education until they were actually able to build her a cabin that was attached to the school. School Ida lived in that cave along with all the wonderful little creatures here at Castle Rock. So next time you visit the Castle Rock cave, make sure uh, you pay a little tribute to Ida and to her wonderful teaching skills here at the park. Uh, Alex, come join me up. Thank you guys so much for listening to our campfire program. Oh, man. Thank you guys for joining. That's uh, all the time we have for today, but I really appreciate you joining us for our campfire, A Tale of Two Parts. Uh, really diving in. I hope you got a better understanding of the similarities that make this area special, but also the differences of our park that really set us apart and make us special, not just here in the Santa Cruz Mountains, but among all parks. Um, I'm gonna send it back real quick down to my friends at Henry Cowell. Dylan, Leslie, you wanna say goodbye? <laughs> Thank you all very much for joining us once again. Um, and please remember to douse your campfires and uh, maybe we'll see you around the parks. Thanks for tuning in, folks. Bye. <laughs> Bye, thank you guys. Campfire's over, people. <laughs>